I love booty calls. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's my mug. Okay, I'm here with the wonderful, talented, and beautiful Krista Miola. She's a, a boudoir photographer that's based in New York, I want to say. New York City, that's correct. New York City. So she's one of those highfalutin, fashionable, <laughs> cool, hipster photographers. <laughs> no, she's not. The most down-to-earth yeah. photographer you'd ever want to meet, but someone who creates... So an amazing body of work, which we're going to be talking about, The Art of Boudoir Photography. This is her book right here if you're watching the video. So, Krista, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. Thanks. Wow, what an introduction. <laughs> you're awesome. <laughs> hey, it's what I do. It's what I do. Come on. <laughs> right. You make people look cool. Was, I am most did you hear my New York? That was my New York accent. Did you hear that? Was it? I yeah. must have Let me do it again. Sorry. It's what I do. <laughs> okay. No. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Didn't work, huh? Work on that one. I'm going to work on it. I'm going to work on it. Okay. <laughs> well, cool. Let's start with you. So, um, okay. you know, boudoir photography, we're definitely going to dive into that because you literally wrote the book on it. And mm -hmm. I love that type of photography. Um, I have a tons, tons of questions. I had to kind of distill my questions down so we wouldn't go like five hours on this. Oh, okay. So yeah, there's a lot to talk about. Yeah, there's a lot to talk about. So let's start with uh, just an introduction to you and the kind of stuff that you, you know, just your, your history and your path into photography. So how did you, how did you get started in this stuff? Uh, okay, into photography. Well, as long as I can remember, actually, I've had a camera. It was my favorite thing to do when I was a kid. So like six years old, I was already shooting. Um, and it was just my favorite thing to do. So when I was um, eight years old, my teachers in school Long story short, they needed to create a special program for me because I was finishing my work early. And they said, what would you like to learn? And I said, photography, yeah. you know, and I was eight. Wow. <laughs> so the head of the gifted and talented department happened to be a hobbyist. So they changed a um, janitor's closet, like in the school, a janitor's closet into a dark room and just taught me photography. For it was one kid. Really special. For one kid, uh, they did that. Well, I luckily I was the one to ask, but there was three kids okay. in the program um, in the school, so I was one of three in the dark room. That is crazy. Anthony Artali and Laura Gurley, shout out! <laughs> <laughs> uh, so yeah, um, so that was very early on in elementary school, and honestly, I just you know pretty self taught since then. Um, and I got a professional camera for Christmas. Um, my parents saved up and got me one. Um, and that was like my one Christmas gift. And so, you know, I've supported myself through school. Like during college, work study was, you know, school newspaper photographer. And then I got out and got a real job, which I thought was a real job. Uh -oh. um, and I didn't start a business with photography until 2004. Um, and how that came about was just friends were looking for photographer uh, for photography services for various reasons. One needed an actor's headshot, one needed family photos, and I just and they weren't happy with what they were getting and what was out there. So I was like, oh, I mean, um, give me, I'll borrow a camera and take some pictures for you. Might be better than that. Um, yep. And it just kind of took off since then. So that was 2004, and I just started the business pretty, right away. And, uh, and, and how did you make the transition into boudoir photography? Because that's, that's very niche, and you could have gone model, you could have gone fashion. You're right. a boudoir expert. Why, why that direction? Um, I think... Well, that's kind of what was asked of me. Really? I kind of yeah. just go where the energy goes. Mm -hmm. And um, so I had a friend of a friend ask me to take sexy pictures of her. And I had never heard of that, really, that that was kind of a thing or a niche. I hadn't heard the term. Um, so, yeah. And I just, from that one photo shoot, I blogged it. And then her friends and then her friend's friends. So and cool. um you know, that was fall of 2009, and I didn't even photograph my first nude until a year later, the summer for my birthday. I went and uh, took a workshop with Kim Weston. You know Edward Weston. Mm -hmm. So he's Edward Weston's grandson, and he still lives at Wildcat. And, uh, you know, it was so historic. It was just so magical. So um, I just kind of fell in love with photographing the female and I've just been a photography lover forever. So, 
you know, I started teaching very soon after that. I was asked to teach boudoir, um, you know, at PartnerCon, various different, you know, WPPI and other yeah. places. And then Ted called and asked me to write the book. And Pete Pitt, so, yeah. yes. So I very much have just been responding to need and demand. I don't know. But, but all the while keeping the art is, it seems to be at the center. So looking, by the way, this book is really well made. So congratulations on this. It is a beautifully written laid out design um and just content rich book that just sort of goes into like we were talking about before we started mm-hmm. recording this book kind of goes through from the beginning all the way up until the business aspect which i'm assuming there may be the business of boudoir photography coming up <laughs> there may be there yeah. may be uh, yeah. yeah so ted and i were very specific about creating a very thorough book and in order to do that within your page limit um, we had to say, okay, this is going to be the art of creating photographs of women, not, you know, you can't go into selling marketing pricing and all that within one book. Yeah. So yeah, they've been asking, when's the next book? What are you going to do? And I'm just like, Ooh, give me a minute. Which yeah. <laughs> it, it was a really interesting process. So um, here, here's a question, Krista. So the, so positioning wise, and just for people that aren't familiar with boudoir photography, uh, photography in general it's you know describe what the art form is just so we have a baseline definition of what boudoir photography is okay well i just think it's um photography of women that has is sensual in nature and that's it it doesn't necessarily have to be anything it's up to you to define it and what do you feel it is mm-hmm. um i mean it doesn't mean that she's wearing lingerie or not she can be wearing anything. She could be wearing a snowsuit or nothing. Mm. Um, and it doesn't have to be in any specific location. I feel like a lot of people define it as, you know, lingerie, sexy pictures in a bedroom. And it can be contemplative. It, it could be all different moods and emotions. But the mood of it is sensual. Does okay. that make sense? That makes total sense. So then how do you how do you draw the line? And is there a line between boudoir photography and, say, glamour? photography because I've seen the words used interchangeably and I don't know if there's a difference between the two or if there's just an overlap how do you how do you delineate between the two again this is something I mean I don't necessarily know if I'm the person to define the categories you wrote the book you are the person (laughs) (laughs) you know I'm not sure what glamour means I think that just means beautiful portraiture Mm -hmm. Um, and it's probably focused more on the face and yeah. boudoir, I'd imagine, encapsulates that and the body. Okay. Um, but these are such it's, it's, all, it's all foggy. It's all, you know, it's just, it's beautiful women captured tastefully and artistically, right? Right. So, yeah. I think for me, glamour implies a little bit of very, like, hair and makeup and you know, for me, boudoir is just come as you are. Oh, really? And See that? That's the that's the line because I that's that's exactly how I describe glamour. Would be there's a makeup artist and hair and you know mm-hmm. they're like over the top. <laughs> it's almost like a fashion shoot, but it's more on the sexy right. side. And boudoir, you're saying is more it's more realistic. Um, for me, I I feel like it's just. M- I'm more interested in a woman's um, natural beauty and I, my brand anyway is to try and pull that out. So more and more I am really trying to capture the woman exactly as she is because that's kind of what's important to me. Um, I think, you know, there's a movement here to empower women and to hold up the imperfect regular woman next door as the ideal instead of, you know, a Photoshopped um, fashion model. And, Part of me has been realizing there's a bit of a conflict then when I send out my images to be edited, you know, to be retouched. So less and less, like my my pictures are going out more and more naked, so to speak, without any, you know, retouching. But this is a whole juicy topic because you can also argue that makeup in and of itself, is, you know, it's all smoke and mirrors. What we do with angles and posing and, you know, lighting and stuff. It's mm-hmm. all smoke and mirror, so to it speak. Is. So yeah. who's to say, you know? Yeah, we hear, you know, we, we hear that argument on the show a lot about there, there's purist photographers and then photographers. And I put myself on the other side of like, no, <clears throat> no pixel is, is, you know, <laughs> free from my punishing it. You know, I, I even said pixels <laughs> were born to be punished. 
And then there, oh. <laughs> there are photographers. And then there are photographers that that say, you know, okay, it you you should crop in the camera, never t- never crop outside the camera. Um, it should be exactly what the camera sees, you know, that kind of thing. And, you know, and there's no right answer, in my opinion. It's it's no, especially exactly. when you're talking art. If you're talking photojournalism. Yeah. Then you want sure. you want to be true to the scene. But if you're talking art, no pixel is safe from me. <laughs> right. Well, to, I have a, many things to say about that. But yeah. I absolutely right. Whatever is meaningful to you. Is it more meaningful you to depict what's honestly in front of you? Or is it more meaningful for you to give a woman like fantasy for the day? So a life where you have no stretch marks and you have no, you know, whatever it yeah. means to you. There is no right or wrong. And there's a photographer for every woman out there. Yeah. So and but I do want to say punishing pixels. That's a horrible image. Can't you say like lovingly massage each pixel? I mean, come on. I, I envision a mallet, and I'm just it's like it's like a, a a blacksmith hammering the steel into position. You know. Wow, but even by the way, with uh, photojournalism, what depending on which lens you, lens you use, it very much alters what's actually in front of you. So yeah. yeah. You know, yeah, yeah, that's the other thing, yeah, because yeah, I think that's where I was going earlier. Because with the you know, the purest photographers, they say, you know, you can't, no cropping, no editing, it's got to be true to the shot. But then you're you're making decisions with the your focal length choices, sure. you know, the cam, even the camera choices, the sensor size choices, where you position yourself and the lighting. If you're using natural lighting, even your position is influencing the scene and your interpretation of the scene. So yeah, it's splitting. It's it's not exactly splitting hairs, but it's you know I think it's a losing argument to say that that manipulating or changing an image in any way is wrong. Yeah, you know, but I agree. I would agree with you on that completely. Yeah. So yeah. I'm looking. I'm looking in your book. So when yeah. are we going to see Krista Miola starting to shoot the male form as well as the female form? Why, <laughs> why are there no men in here? <laughs> what, well, that's about the art of um, creating stunning images of women. So. Yeah, yeah. You know, the shooting men's a whole other book. Yes. <laughs> and I can't know. I'm only kidding. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's a whole other side of Krista. Is gonna uh, but um, actually, uh, the current post on my blog right now is a couple, which I had never done before. Because mm-hmm. it was very clear on, you know, then that's a whole uh, different thing. My specialty has always been in, you know, focusing on a woman enjoying herself, being comfortable in her body and loving life. And um, when you throw another person in there, it just changes it. So it's also dicey in terms of, you know, the actual practical elements of the photo shoot. If you know what I mean. So yeah, Yeah. Yeah, it's tricky. It it can be tricky. It's a, yeah, I think you're dancing around. It could be a fine line between art and something that gets, pornographic or exactly. across the line you know especially when you're dealing with nude forms if you introduce a male and a female into it then then yeah it, it, it becomes a little blurry exactly and you know you got to be safe so I have a male assistant and you know other people on set and I've said um, yes to certain couples who I can just tell I have good intuition, um, so, but there's rules, like the guy can't take his clothes off, sure, of and stuff like that, and it's really just a suggestion of things, yeah. you know, there's not a lot of contact, and it's just really part of the boudoir session, so I'll say, okay, your last look, let's do three looks, just, you know, you, and then at the very end, you know, your man can come on set and we can shoot a, for, you know, a few minutes with him. Yeah. And it's like a bonus, though, at the end. It's it like is a like a bonus. Yeah. Yes. That's cool. <laughs> so what's, what's your process for putting women at ease to get these amazing shots? Because <clears throat> the, when I yeah. shoot women, there's always the there's a wall initially and that you need to break through to like, okay, I'm not crazy. I'm not going to make you look bad. It's this is all right. You know? So there's that psychological barrier to get through. What's your process for breaking through that to get these like crazy shots? Even the cover of your book has that (laughs) (laughs) an amazing shot. How do you do that? What's your process? Well, actually it's actually quite um, intricate, (laughs) but very simple. Mm -hmm. 
uh, it's, I believe in the success of the shoot, like 90% of it is what you do beforehand when you're talking with real women, for instance, not necessarily the same with models, but with real women, I think the more you prepare them, the better off you are, the more you can, um, preempt what their fears and doubts are. Mm -hmm. And they all have the same five fears and doubts. And I talk about that in the book and then also let them know what to expect. They very much fear the unknown, um, who's going to be on set, how it's going to go down, what you guys will do. And then just take the pressure off them to say, you know, you just show up and have fun making you look good is my job. (laughs) I'm going to worry about that. And trust me, I'm good at what I do and it's all me and we're going to delete anything we don't like. You will never see a picture you don't love. That's That's my job. That is cool. And Yeah. And then again, you just, I have a lot of talks with them about, you know, where's your comfort level in terms of nudity? Um, Here's some do's and don'ts. Uh, And then I, you know, say, send me some inspiration shots because what I think is beautiful or sexy isn't necessarily what you think is beautiful and sexy. You might think more subtle. Some might think more bold. I like to capture all the different um, varieties of emotions that women go through. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, they help plan it. I love a club. Collaboration. I want it to be. They'll value it more highly. They'll remember it. They'll look at a photograph and go, oh, that one was my idea or that was the thing that I picked or whatever. Yeah. And um, that all lends to them being much more relaxed. And also, trust me, they also benefit from me saying, no, I'm not just going to get yes to everything the client says. When I can tell them why that's not necessarily a good idea or why they should or shouldn't do this beforehand, um, they'll trust me more. And then there's, you know couple hours of hair and makeup to relax I start getting them comfortable I start you know with me photographing them while they're in the makeup chair we take behind the scenes and maybe a selfie Instagram shot or whatever and we play music and I think the biggest thing is starting without a discernible beginning Mm. so I'm just while she's half done I take her over and do some lighting tests I'm not really doing and uh, just as she's about finished I'm like okay let me do a makeup test and oh, okay can you just move your clothing here I already have in the, her in the first outfit and then we've already you know and do more of this and turn to the light a little more and, you know so we've already started without her really knowing that we've that's started that's a great tip that's, and that's so you're ramping up <clears throat> you're ramping up into the shoot instead of just saying okay now we are shooting in there in all the right. nervous. It's like getting ready for a test. You're like, okay, we're right. starting the stopwatch. And exactly. We're beginning. It's robe off and yeah. lights on and exactly. go, <laughs> you know, yep. it's nerve wracking. And I also find it makes me a little bit more nervous too. So just having that seamless, you know, playing in the makeup chair, photographing, doing light tests right nearby, getting her back in the hair and makeup chair, then coming out for makeup tests and just keep going. Yeah. Um, it really helps a lot. Uh, do, really you, do you work with the same hair and makeup person generally, or do you vary them? I have a couple different ones because some people aren't always available. So depending on availability, I always check with my favorite first. And mm-hmm. certain hair and makeup um, girls are better than others at certain looks and stuff. So yeah. it depends on who I'm shooting also and what they want. But I always work with the same assistant. Um, he's awesome. We've been together now for over a year. He is amazing. And what is he um, doing? What does your assistant do for you? Yeah, he um, he sets up all the lighting. He will move furniture. He will <laughs> unpack my bags, repack my bags. Mm-hmm. He will hold me so I don't fall off a ladder. Um, watches my back. But while I'm doing something, he's already setting up the next one. So what I've found most of all, he makes me faster. I can now shoot in a third of the time what it would take me because I would be having to stop and then go change the lights, up the wattage, lower it, tweak the, you know, he does all that. Nice. So, um, so, so the process I'm hearing is a client contacts you, contacts you, they may find you through word of mouth or through your website or whatever. They contact mm-hmm. you, you agree to shoot them, you do a collaboration between you and the client with them sending you sample images of the things that they like and don't like and you kind of you kind of get calibrated to their mindset and their their comfortableness with nudity and that kind of thing and right. then you so at that point in there are you and your assistant and the client saying okay we're going to do three looks. One's going to be here in your home, and then we're going to do one in this room, and then we're going to do one on the, on the beach or that kind of thing. Do you collaborate on the locations? 
Yes, we do. So when they send me pictures, we actually organize this through Pinterest. We create a pin board for her, cool. an inspiration board. So we can both pin to it. But so, um, and also you see all in one place, all of the inspiration images, which so easily you can crazy. see what the creative vision is. You can tell right away this woman likes black and whites. So you can tell this woman likes anonymous shots. You don't really see the face. You can tell she either is someone who wants it all glammed up with, you know, heavy makeup and high heels and stuff like that, or she's more soft and natural, just, you know, a tank top jeans, softer sensibility. And yeah, you could see, whoa, this girl likes a lot of ass shots. (laughs) (laughs) Posterior (laughs) shots. Posterior, excuse me. Yes. (laughs) That's so cool. (laughs) Bad form. But, um... So that, Pinterest, that's, you're the first, I believe you're the probably the first photographer that I've talked to that uses Pinterest in their workflow, especially with a, cl- a client interaction. And it makes uh, it makes perfect sense, right? Oh, it's so awesome. It's so easy. And that it's a wealth of images on there. So it's a great one-stop shop for them to go bang, 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 bang. And I always tell them, because they immediately say, well, how much is this? And where do we go? Is it your studio? Is your location? And they say, everything is, you know, based on your creative vision that we collaborate on together and the vision of the shoot we, you know, work on together. Uh, so let's not decide about hair or makeup or uh, wardrobe or location just yet. Let's see where your mind goes inspiration wise. Let's, you know, play first. Yeah. And yeah. it's always apparent, okay, this is a studio shoot for sure, or this is an on location shoot. This is outside or whatever. Mm-hmm. I'm in New York City, and a lot of um, most of my clients are from all over the world, and they fly into New York City and make it like an anniversary gift with their husband or a big 40th birthday party or whatever. Um, So a lot of it that I've been doing this whole year is like with the backdrop of New York City. But I like to create variety. That's my number one thing for anyone listening regarding sales is variety. Mm -hmm. So I like to do... um, I like to do an outdoor look and I like to do an interior and I like to do a studio. So even if I'm on location, I'll bring the studio seamless with me. Mm-hmm. Or if I'm in the studio, we'll run outside. I mean, I try and do that all. And, now, yeah. do, you ha- do you have your own studio? I rent one here in the city. Okay, okay. Yeah, Midtown. That's cool. That, that is, see, yeah. all that's really helpful. So with people flying in, if you're, mm-hmm. are you doing a lot of the shots in like, swanky New York hotel rooms that are, you know, that are just kind of designed for photography or do you do some, uh, there are some beautiful hotels here, but it's super pricey and yeah. they've got to spend quite a bit, um, on that to get I me. Mean, Cause most hotels here are so tiny. Right. So, oh, so, yeah, so I was tiny. just there a couple of weeks ago and I right? stayed in complete non sequitur. I stayed in this hotel called, geez, what was it called? I gotta think of it, but it was this tiny, tiny hotel. It was amazing, but the rooms were so small that they called them cabins. <laughs> right. Well, it may have been the Jane. Um, no, it wasn't the Jane. I'll think of it in like two minutes. It'll come to me. Right. But regardless, so sometimes that isn't always the best answer, hotel yeah. rooms. But, um, you know, in L.A., they're so big. They're so well lit. And there's so many different. I would have, okay, this one's your um, glam from Hollywood, old Hollywood type. And this is your, you know, beachy type hotel Mm -hmm. in New York. Um, the client has to, you know, have the budget to do that. Um, because you have to rent kind of like a junior suite to get anything with the room. Um, and Yotel was the name of the hotel. Yotel. Oh, Yotel. (laughs) Yes. Have you heard of that one? Yes, I have. Yes. Yeah. Rooms are awesome, but they're like, you're in you're an egg in an egg carton, basically. You're in a pod. You're in a pod. <laughs> you're in a pod. You pod. have to leave. If you want to change your mind, you have to leave the room to change your mind. You go back in. It's that. <laughs> That's right. That's right. So New York City has been an adjustment, and I much prefer shooting. Um, uh, you know, in my studio because of it's huge. It's got a lot of natural light, and I love it. But I have to say. I like being challenged all the time and I want it to be different. So it's like, I'll go to Yotel. Sure. Let me make it work. I want to see how I can do. Yeah. But I wouldn't necessarily want to do that with a client who's from out of town. Right. I want yeah, to have it's an experiment at that point And they've got for a sure. finite amount of time. Right. For sure. For yeah. sure. So what about, so you mentioned budget. So what, what are we looking at for one of these kind of sessions? I'm sure it ranges, but generally speaking, somebody flies in, 
if they're flying in to see you, clearly they have budget, you know, <laughs> to, yeah, to yeah. Get it. they're not just going, you know, to a photographer around the corner. They're flying to a different city to see you. What are we looking at price wise? And um, for boudoir, it's 3300 to about 5000 depending on what you want. If you want an album, if you want a CD of the entire session and stuff like that. And in okay. Next year for 2014, I am going to charge differently based on number of looks and number of locations and stuff. Because as I said, this year was a bit of a learning year for me because I had the assistant. And I was like, wow, look, I can do so much more. Yeah. So it takes much less of my time. So we're going to price a little differently for next year. That's but cool. it'll be about the same average. That's really yeah. cool. That's really cool. Cool. So mm-hmm. then let's let's switch gears. I don't want to take up too much more of your time. But I want to sure. chat a little bit about um, gear. And those choices, because we've been talking a lot about gear on on this week in photo. Specifically, there's been this this you know resurgence or insurgence or popularization of mirrorless cameras and all that sort of thing. I was reading through your book, and I know that you shoot with a DSLR, of course. Mm-hmm. So tell me about your the DSLR that you shoot with, the lens choices, the lighting. Like, do you have a standard kit that you take to every? shoot mm-hmm. or do you do you and your assistant sit there and, and look and say okay here's the shoot that we're doing let's go to the gear locker and pick what we need for that particular shoot how does that work yeah um i always bring the same kit with me lighting and my camera bag mm-hmm. so it's always the same i like <clears throat> mastering one thing doing it well and also just with one light there's so many things you can do so i try and keep it to that um in terms oh, one of light. light so you shoot with one light Mostly, yeah. Sometimes I, I had a back. I had a backlight. If if one of the things they love about themselves is their hair, and that it's bit like I'll backlight the hair. Yeah. You know, mm-hmm. come on, I got it. Yeah, of course, of course. But uh, in terms of lenses, I really just work with the fifty and the eighty five one point two. Um, I like the fifty because it's the most faithful. It is what you're seeing, mm-hmm. and I just I love the fifty. So I kind of spend most of my time with that on my camera. Okay. Um, and you're shooting with this 5D or 7D? Or oh, sorry. I'm shooting with a Canon 5D Mark okay. Three. Got it. Got it. Okay. And uh, so, yeah, I spend most of the time with the 50. And I don't find myself often wishing I had something else. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. I don't feel like very many times am I wishing I had another lens. Um Occasionally, I'll need to put on the 2470 because I need more room. I, I don't have enough room to get everything I want in frame. But if also I'm in a huge rush and I need to create a ton of variety fast, if there was only one lens that I could bring to a shoot, it would be the 2470. Sure. It's going to create the most variety. I can go in a lot of different places with it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, and then sometimes the 85 because it's just a beautiful close up lens. I do that for my close ups. Yeah, I love that. Um, yeah, and, that, and the, that, the one light that you use, what's the what is that? Is it is it a mono light or who makes it? It's Ellen Chrome. Okay. Got the it. B the BXRI. Okay. Yeah. Um, and I use an Octobox, uh, the big one. Um, 53 if I can fit it or you know bigger is better right yeah right yeah um, and then or a medium soft box um, you know and, and, that's, and just for, uh, for technically for the folks who are saying why does she use a big soft box so from a technical standpoint what does a big light give you Krista <laughs> Uh, well, a couple of things. One is it'll light, you know, the whole body and the background. If I just, you know, want universally flattering light, um, from the front, that's pretty much a safe choice. Mm -hmm. The Octobox also is for, I like it because of round catch lights. Um, so that's one reason why I like the bigger box. Um, if I was to go down, it was because maybe I don't want the spill onto the back ground so if i'm doing some side lighting or if i'm just doing up here or i want to get a nice focused light i'll i'll use that one okay and then then so we've got the shots we planned that we talked through planning the shoot we've got that we've done the shoot now the shoot is done you're doing mm-hmm. post-processing you kind of alluded to earlier that you send your, your shots out for retouching how does that that whole piece work yeah, sure. Well, if we take a step back and we talk about editing, meaning doing my selects, I yeah. go fast and I use my gut and I go in reverse order. Um, that was one tip I gave in the book that, you know, I would find when I was editing, I'd 
click, yeah, that one's good. Oh, that one's nice too. Okay, that one's good too. And I kept selecting everything. Mm-hmm. And if you think about it, as you're coaching a woman, you are obviously coaching her to do things better. Okay, turn here and then hand that way and then this. And then you move on once you nail it. So mm-hmm. I find when I go backward, I'm like the best ones right off the bat. Right? Because you move on right. after you know it. So when I work backwards, gee, uh, so much faster. So, and I just use my gut and I like to select the ones I edit for emotion, I say, instead of technical perfection because I'm shooting for real women, not shooting stock photography. And I don't necessarily like, oh, maybe like she fell out of frame a little bit, but oh, the laughter here is so amazing. She looks great. And yeah, it cut off the tip, but like, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Or the lighting's better here, but this one, you know, uh, showcases her better, or whatever. Yeah. So I edit for emotion, the ones that hit me at the gut, the one I feel something for. And then I call it down to 35 images. I don't, no one needs to look at 100 plus, and I'm trying to manage her job, which is going to be deciding. Yeah. And so I make sure they're very different. I include close-ups and full body shots, masters, details, action, shutter drag shots, stills, um, you know, laughter, serious, all the body parts that she said she loves about her. So in the interview before the um, session, I tell, I ask her, what do you love about your body? What excites you about doing this shoot? What do you hope to get out of it? Um, what are you hoping it does for you? Like all of that is insight into how to photograph her and what your shot list will be and what you'll wind up showing her. Um, it's kind of a cheeky answer, but when people ask me, how do you flatter a plus size girl or a mature girl? It doesn't matter. It's, what do you love about your body? It's the easiest way to flatter anyone. I'm going to focus on what you tell me that you love and the rest I'm not going to worry about. So when I'm editing down, I'm not necessarily, I was teaching in Spain this week and I kind of, we focused on this part. I'm not necessarily selecting my 35 best images because my best images are probably, you know, from one set that I really loved. Mm-hmm. But I need to create a complete, totally different from each other set. So I'm looking for a variety. I want to hit all the different emotions. I want to have, you know, like I said, all of those different shots I was just mentioning. So editing becomes a lot easier when you turn off the part of your brain that's thinking, I'm just got to pick my best. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah, then once that, you, you once you get that 35, you're you're happy with that one set. Where do mm-hmm. those go? So do they do you put them in a gallery and if so where where do they where are they hosted? I do um I just do Lightroom adjustments if my white balance was off for some reason, maybe I'll tweak that or very little do I do in Lightroom. But um I've been working with presets a little lately just to contrast grain or whatever. Sure. Um but, uh, yeah, then the client will see it. I always do in person sales, so I always walk her through a slideshow of the uh, okay so you're not you're yeah. not doing you're not doing okay, you pick the thirty five and you upload them to smug muggers in folio or pictage or something no, how do, no. how does the how does that piece work you they just yeah. come to your studio and you project them or I don't, I never did project boudoir. I just feel like you don't really want to see your bum the size of a billboard. Sure. That's what I was. So like, I, I don't project. I'm also not trying to sell wall art. So another reason why I don't do projection right now, it's just on my laptop and I'll meet them, you know, for brunch or for cocktails or whatever. We take a very private booth at this restaurant I love. It's literally like this enclave. It's so cool. And it's part of my brand to be it's luxury. We, you know, have a drink or whatever and we kind of giggle over the photographs. Um so that's what I like to do. And I show them in a slideshow. And and you're in Lightroom stepping through them, just going through and like and then do it in iPhoto. It's super simple and easy. And because I shoot a lot of out of towners, if they're leaving like in forty eight hours and I'm not able to schedule wise get them done. Um, normally they'll come in on Thursday. I'll shoot them on Friday, show them their pictures on Sunday. But for some reason that's not going to work. I'll do a Skype like this, Mm -hmm. um, but just share my screen. So we'll do the session that way. And it's the exact same. Um, and I don't talk a lot. The sales session goes like this. It's super, I keep pricing no brainer. There's no decisions to make except Mm -hmm. yes, I want them all. (laughs) And, uh, yeah. So have so they decided before you sh- before you start the shoot? Much like wedding photography, wedding photographers will have already sold, pre-sold a particular package, and at the end, the deliverable is X, Y, and Z. You know, two albums, this, this, this kind of thing. 
So then mm-hmm. you're shooting for that. Are you doing the same thing or are you shooting kind of on spec where they kind of know what the price range is? And then when you sit down in that booth, then they say, yeah, I want this many photos. Therefore, it goes into this level package. How does that well, work? Right, right now, I, my um, session includes an album. So their decision really is only do I want to purchase the CD or not okay. at that time. And then after we design the album, then they we don't try and bombard them with decisions. There's only one decision at every step we make. So at that, it's just, do you want the CD Mm -hmm. of all the images? And then next, yeah, exactly. One decision at a time. And then next is, okay, here's the album. Do you have any changes and all that? And then it's, do you want to upgrade your size album? Comes with a five by five. Do you want the eight by eight or the 10 by 10? That's the next decision. And then, okay, what do you want on the cover? So we never overwhelm them with how many pages, what color, silk, or do you want leather? Do you want a cover photo? What do you want texted into it? And did you want the CD? And should I ever touch these for you? And just like, you know what I mean? Yeah, it's all in there. It's all inclusive. So they don't have to make any... They're not they're not overthinking the process with with right. overwhelming decisions. So the, with the right. with the album. So then you do. Do you have like a you know, this is the 2013 or 2014 version of Krista's cover. These, these are the this is the we're using leather for 2013 and then 2014 <laughs> we're going to linen, you know, or do, you, or do how does that piece work? Yeah, no, I've always kept been leather craftsman and I like to keep it classic and I, cool. you know, I like to keep it simple and I, I really like timeless. That's also a part of my brand. So I don't offer any trendy products, the latest this, that and the other. And I don't offer, you know, fur covers or studded this, that or the other. It's and just no wall prints, class. no wall, metal, none of that stuff. Uh, you know what? Um, if they do want an enlargement, then they can. I say we can do this on whatever suits your home and whatever your sensibility is. I don't do canvas because I just I don't like don't it. Don't like canvas. <laughs> <laughs> I don't love it. I don't love it. I'll tell you the honest yeah. truth. And what I teach is it shouldn't be on your price list Price list if you don't believe in it. Yeah. Um, yeah. Oh, and by the way, I did want to mention, though, one thing about a la carte pricing when I was that and it wasn't all inclusive. You still only want to give them one decision at a time. Then their decision could be like after they see their images, OK, do you want to stick with the a la carte pricing because you like this, this and this? That actually is more affordable and it's a better value if you went with the package. So, OK. And then, yes, I'll take a package. That's the first question a la carte or packaging and then the package which one do you want small medium large yeah and then that's it you don't bother them with decisions for a while. i love it it's almost like you're yeah it's just like one decision leads to the next the next the next instead of having a list of decisions that they have to make and get overwhelmed right right and it's not that you're trying to surprise them with pricing and not give that all up front you will but you can just say you know, my clients spend between thirty five hundred to five thousand. Or if you want a CD that starts at X Y Z, keep it in broad strokes. Prints start at a dollar fifty a square inch. Give them the information, but you know, you don't need to overwhelm with the five page pricing catalog that includes everything under the sun. Yeah, uh, that's that's you know that's really interesting. Uh, the psych the the psychology aspect of and marketing aspect of that because. It seems like when you when you go down in value or lower level services, they overwhelm you with information and choices. And the higher tier you go to, you know, these like like really specific and high level photographers like yourself, the decisions Mm -hmm. get fewer and fewer and fewer. And the photographer (laughs) makes it simple and painless for you to to spend money. Right. Right. I also think it's a natural evolution of knowing who you are, knowing what your brand is, knowing who your client is and taking that responsibility more and more. And it's not like, well, whatever they like, they might like this. They might like that. Instead, I think the photographer takes a little more ownership of it. Like, no, they're buying me for my aesthetic and my preference and my choices. They want to see what I, you know, what I believe in and what I offer. That's brilliant. See, that's brilliant. Because a lot of photographers, I think, uh, think that they're selling their art on that two dimensional. You know, it's it's the print. You know, it's I'm you're tra- you're buying me and my artistic interpretation of you and the image and all that. But it stops there. And it sounds like what you're saying is it doesn't stop there. Your brand extends all the way through to that final product and your decision making process around le- leather craftsmen. You know, even the presentation of the at the restaurant where you're meeting at, it's all part of the Krista Miola brand 
And, oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think, well, brand, I mean, I, we can go all day about branding. Me I'm too. I love it. Huge <laughs> geek about branding. I love it. Right here. But, uh, <laughs> Yeah, it's the client's experience. And that starts the moment they hear your name or see your website. And that doesn't end ever. You know, anytime they look at that thing you created together, that's their experience. Every time they think about, you know, the memory and how they feel when they look at that stuff or think about it, that's really what the experience is, the emotion that it evokes in them. So at every step, we try our best to have them feeling positive. That's why we always want to be a step ahead. We want to prevent those fears and doubts. And that's why I always say call. The most important call you make to your client is the one after the photo shoot. Like immediately after that night, you shot her that day, call her that night because she's sitting there worrying, doubting herself. It's as if she went on a date, got naked. And I was like, oh, what did I do? And now she's looking at the photographs at home, my bum on her computer. So we try and you know, manage her uh, experience manage every time. Manage fears, the FUD, right? Manage the fear, uncertainty, and doubt, right? That's, that's exactly right. So, yeah, 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 but that extends far. Mm-hmm. So then what about, um, so that so we got all the way through it, um, deliverable. So you, you've got the album, it's done, they've picked them, they're ecstatic. How do you get them the actual album? Does, does your brand extend there where you're actually going to hand deliver it to them or... And if possible, you know, because like right. you said, they're flying in. A lot of them are flying in. So they're just shipped. And how does that piece work? Yeah. I barely shoot anyone in town. I got to be honest. Um, we leather craftsmen um, brands, the box and the album with our logo. So it's fully branded and customized and it's drop shipped to them. Um, and usually it's, we're on a time schedule because it's usually a gift or you know mm-hmm. it's, we've got a, you know a timeline on it so Good. the faster it's interesting. the better I've, I've heard some some you know not that this is wedding photography but i've heard some wedding photographers when they're talking about the time between when the wedding is over and the when they deliver the actual proofs in the final album particularly mm-hmm. the final album time that they artificially pad the time in there to increase the perceived value so even if the album is going to be created in a week which generally it takes right Even Mm -hmm. if it takes a week, they'll say, yeah, it's going to be about three months, two to three months, you know, because it takes time for this stuff to get created. Increasing (laughs) the, yeah, increasing (laughs) the, the, uh, like, oh, wow, they're really spending time on this thing idea. Yeah, you cannot neglect perceived value. I mean, it's definitely built into my session. I know how long I need. I don't, I don't, I could do a session so fast now, but you know, they're flying all the way out here. I don't want the experience to last 45 minutes. Right. Yeah. You know, uh, so we definitely do that. But I hadn't thought about uh, the time it takes to do the album. So, yeah, that's a good one. I <laughs> yeah. love it. Yeah. I love Pad it. that in there a little bit. And they're like, oh, wow, this is this is their leather craftsmen. Of course, <laughs> they're crafting yeah. this. Yeah. yeah, they are handcrafting it for yeah. sure. sure. So then so let's wrap this up. So what's what's next for Krista Miola? You know, what's what's the next big project you're working on? Oh my goodness. So many exciting things. I'm excited for 2014. Like I said, I think 2013 was a year of major growth and transition for me. So, um, my team and I are kind of having a year end. Uh, we have it twice a year, um, brainstorm kind of, I do this. I used to do this for myself. It's a Tony Robbins exercise. What did we love? How do we cultivate more of what we loved? What did we not like? And how can we eliminate that from our process? And everything so i'm sure another book is going to be out there i'm sure um i'm a whole new rebrand and new website um we've got new team members on board and so we're really growing um i think my assistant is now going to be an associate shooter i mean he's really good and uh he's been on set with me all year yeah so like an apprentice kind of right Yeah, so we're going to add associates to the team because we get so many inquiries, um, I guess because of the book or, you know, my blog has been out there for a while now. Um, And we're just, um, I just can't do everybody and I'm not in everyone's budget level. And there's some people I really feel could benefit from, you know, our team's sensibility. 
Love and it. our experience. So we we're yeah, we're adding on associates and stuff. Yeah. So that's the name of the great game in twenty fourteen is growth, it sounds like, right? Yes, yes, absolutely. Cool. So what's uh what's the URL that you would like listeners to go check out your work at and get the book and all that stuff? Sure. Krista Miola dot com. C H R I S T A M E O L A. So that's it. I mean you can find it all on there. You can get on the mailing list by downloading the um Pro Photographer Manifesto, which is, you know, fifteen habits of successful pros. Cause I have pros that are very good friends of mine that are successful and have longevity. Um you know, I'm not even the oldest one. I've been around since 2004. But, uh, you know, and then I teach thousands of students. I've taught thousands of students. So I can see what separates them so clearly, the struggle, the ones that struggle and the ones that are successes. So um, that will get you on my mailing list. And you can get more information about workshops on the website. And uh, we do an online workshop, which kind of takes the book, The Art of Boudoir, and it takes it to the next level. It's all that business stuff. Um, selling, pricing, marketing, branding, Amazing. soft lighting. You get to see behind the scenes videos. And it's six weeks with me ongoing. And uh, we just are finishing up. In fact, I have a call starting now. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so, yeah. So, um, yeah, that's also info available on my website. Awesome. And friend me up, man. I'm, I love geeking out like on Instagram and Facebook and stuff. So, and Pinterest. Don't forget Pinterest. Pinterest, most importantly. Yes. So I'm on there. Krista, thank you for taking the time today. This has been one of the most educational interviews that I've done to date. So you are, you are amazing. And congratulations on the book, The Art of Boudoir Photography, available wherever you buy books at, right? Yes, Barnes & Noble, Amazon. It's, it's out there. Thank Excellent. you. Excellent. Okay. You have a good hey. day, and I will talk, I'll be in touch. I'll talk to you soon. All right. Talk soon.